Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here today. It is my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, Jr. The Secretary and the Chairman will deliver opening remarks and then have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on reporters and would just ask you to limit your follow-up so that we can give your colleagues a chance to ask their questions. Mr. Secretary, over to you, sir. Thanks, Pat. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. General Brown and I have just come from another highly productive meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. And this was our 23rd meeting. And every time we gather, I am impressed by the resolve of the more than 50 countries helping to support Ukraine's self-defense. Today, the contact group heard directly about the battlefield situation from Minister Umerov and his delegation. Ukraine's forces are holding the line in the face of Russia's assault near Kharkiv. And Ukrainian troops continue to inflict significant costs on the Kremlin's invaders. After President Biden signed the National Security Supplemental, renewed U.S. assistance is reaching Ukraine at a steady pace. And last week, President Biden announced a new security assistance package through another drawdown from our stocks. And this, this $225 million package provides Ukraine with more air defense interceptors, armored vehicles, anti-tank weapons, and artillery systems and munitions. And Ukraine's partners around the world continue to stand up to Putin's aggressions. This coalition remains steadfast and strong. And the contact group remains determined to meet Ukraine's urgent capability needs and to help Ukraine deter Russian aggression for decades to come. Contact group members continue to step up and to get Ukraine what it needs and when it needs it. Air defense remains Ukraine's top priority. I applaud those who have dug deep to find more air defense systems and interceptors. For example, the Netherlands is leading a smart initiative to assemble and deliver a Patriot air defense system. The Dutch government has committed to contribute many core components and parts from its own stocks and has called on Ukraine's other friends to help with the rest. And meanwhile, Sweden recently announced its largest military package for Ukraine. That includes 155 millimeter artillery shells, AMRAAM missiles, and armored vehicles. Sweden is also providing airborne early warning and control aircraft, which will help Ukraine with both airborne and maritime targets. And Italy announced that it will send a second SAMT air defense system to Ukraine. And so our allies are also committing to long-term military aid packages. More and more countries are enshrining these commitments in long-term bilateral agreements with Ukraine. And I'm pleased that the United States and Ukraine will sign our own bilateral security agreement today. Together, we're working to forge long-term security for Ukraine. And I continue to be impressed by the work of the contact group's capability coalitions. Today, we heard an update from the drone cap uh, coalition. And let me thank Latvia and the UK for their leadership of the drone coalition. This capability coalition is helping to expand Ukraine's asymmetric, asymmetric capabilities. And that's especially important as Putin relies on Iranian UAVs to target Ukrainian city, uh, cities and civilians. This is just one of the eight capability coalitions, and they're doing outstanding work. Together, we're helping Ukraine build a formidable future force, one that can deter aggression over the long haul. We remain determined to keep supporting Ukraine while ensuring our own military readiness at this challenging moment. And that includes a robust defense industrial base. So we spent time today discussing ways to expand the production of critical munitions and systems and to deepen our coordination through the capability coalitions. Now, I just want to be clear about why I've convened this group, this contact group, 
23 times now. Putin thinks that he gets to determine which countries are real and which countries can be wiped off the map. That's incredibly radical and incredibly dangerous. So let's be clear. Putin started this war by invading his peaceful neighbor. A permanent member of the UN Security Council is trying to deny democracy to more than 43 million people. And the Kremlin's war of imperial aggression has horrified countries around the world. Ukraine matters to the United States and to the entire world. If Ukraine falls under Putin's boot, Europe would fall under Putin's shadow. If Putin tramples Ukraine, he would be emboldened to commit more acts of aggression. And the world would enter a far, far more dangerous stage. So we understand the stakes, and the outcome of the war in Ukraine will help set the trajectory for global security for decades to come. And this contact group will continue to defend Ukraine's sovereignty and all of our security. So we will continue to stand up to Putin's aggression and atrocities. We will continue to find new options to get Ukraine the air defenses that it needs to defend its skies. And we will continue to move heaven and earth to get Ukraine what it needs to live in freedom. And with that, General Brown, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now, just last week on the June 6, I was on the beaches of Normandy to, to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. We're alongside uh, President Biden, Secretary Austin, and other world leaders. We honor some of the last living veterans who fought in World War II, our greatest generation. On the evening of 6 June 1944, President Franklin D. Roosevelt provided a public statement describing the brave man fighting a world away. He said, they fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill will among all thy people. D-Day showed us the power of cooperation. It showed us that liberty prevails over aggression when nations come together for a just cause. Now we find ourselves in another crux of history. This is a driving force of this Ukraine defense contact group. To come together, united for the cause of Ukraine, for the cause of our nations, and for the cause of the future. Once again, I want to thank Secretary Austin for your steadfast leadership in uh, guiding this international coalition. I also want to thank uh, Defense Minister Umarov, who uh, joined us today and for the, his continued leadership of Ukraine's uh, military forces. And to all the nations that are re represented here today, I also want to thank them. Their contributions have supported Ukraine's effort to maintain its sovereignty. Russia's war in Ukraine tests the very foundation of security on which the world relies. Russia's unprovoked aggression challenges the security and prosperity of all nations. As I've said before, might does not make right but might does shape outcomes. Through this contact group's collective support of Ukraine, we are aligning the might of this world with what is right. The global response to Russia's unprovoked aggression has degraded their power and prestige, forcing them to further into isolation. <coughs> and our unity only grows stronger. Even so, Russia continues their attempts to advance across multiple battlefronts to include their recent assault on Kharkiv. Russia is concentrating fire and attempting to uh, target Ukrainian resupply and, re and reinforcement abilities. Ukraine's ability to surge firepower and reposition troops has countered Russia's offensive and disrupted their attack. Ukraine continues to ho hold strong. And with this group's contributions, the Ukrainians are exacting heavy costs on the Russian aggressors. It's why our ongoing support is so critical. Sustaining Ukraine's ability to defend itself is both a present and long-term effort. This group's work in providing Ukraine with the necessary systems, munitions, and capabilities has been remarkable. To be effective, fighting forces need continued access to military capabilities and supplies. And our support combined with the Ukrainian uh, will to fight 
has proven time and time again that Ukraine will not bend. Their fighting spirit is ironclad. But will itself is not enough, which is why we remain focused and dedicated to these efforts. Just last week, as Secretary Austin mentioned, uh, we announced the 59th uh, drawdown package of military capabilities for Ukraine. This was just part of an incredible uh, contributions recently made by some 50 nations of this coalition. And an example of how this coalition remains dedicated to supplying Ukraine with the tools they need to counter ongoing Russian aggression. Outside of Ukraine's courageous people and their resilient combat forces, the unwavering support of the nations gathered here today remains one of their greatest assets. These nations are committed to working together to help Ukraine address the challenges ahead. We are stronger when we work together. This solidarity is rooted in a shared history of security and fostered by the principles of democracy, sovereignty, and international law. For the past 80 years, these principles have preserved peace among the nations that uphold them. This contact group, united by these ideals, stands firm against any challenge, demonstrating the true power resides in a cooperative effort by like-minded nations fighting for freedom. World War II taught us that unchecked aggression spreads conflict to the rest of the world. It is in these moments, as President Roosevelt said, that brave men and women must fight in conquest to liberate and to let justice arise. The brave service members of the Allied Nations came together 80 years ago and executed Operation Overlord, knowing that freedom and sovereignty depended upon their success. Today, peace and security are not only achieved through military readiness of individual, individual nations. They are achieved through collective effort, through aligning our resources and abilities, in support of defending Ukraine, defending democracy, and defending sovereignty. Thank you, and I look forward to, to your questions. Thank you both, gentlemen. First question, we'll go to Politico. Laura. Thank you. Uh, thanks, sir, for doing this. Um, Secretary Austin, President Zelensky has specifically asked for more air defenses. Uh, Germany has announced an additional Patriot. Italy has announced a SAMT. Will the U.S. answer that call and deliver an additional Patriot to Ukraine? And if you can't answer that, or if the answer is no today, what is the holdup? And then for General Brown, Ukraine has said it has 30 pilots ready to go through pilot training for F-16s, but there are not enough spots at, in the U.S. to take that. Is that true from your perspective? And if so, are you looking at expanding that training pipeline, or are you confident that Ukraine will have enough pilots and maintainers trained on the planes by the time they arrive this summer? Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Regarding uh, Patriots, um, you know, air defense has been at the top of my agenda uh, for a long time. And for month after month, you've heard me emphasize uh, the importance of uh, providing uh, Ukraine additional air defenses. You know that we've provided a Patriot to them uh, already. Uh, but not only that, uh, me and President Biden and Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken spent a great deal of our time uh, encouraging others uh, to, uh, to provide additional capabilities. And it's not just Patriots, it's, it's uh, NASAMs, it's, it's uh, SAMPTs, it's, it's, you know, a, uh, a number of capabilities that, uh, that Ukraine needs, and they need the interceptors to, uh, to complement the, the platforms. I don't have any announcements on, uh, on Patriot batteries today, but what I can tell you is that I continue to work this, uh, and, uh, and I'm in constant contact with my Ukrainian counterpart, uh, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they have the capability that they need, and that we get it there as quickly as we can. Laura, yeah, yeah. we have an Air Force uh, uh, capability coalition. It's one of the eight capability coalitions that's focused on, um, in this case, working with the uh, Ukrainians to get their, their fourth generation uh, fighter capability uh, up and running. The um, United States is one of the co-leads associated with that. And so not only do we help provide training for their pilots, uh, there's other countries that are also uh, supporting the, uh, the training as, as well. So there is capacity. Uh, uh, for uh, training um, both in the United States but also with some of the partners as part of that, that capability coalition. 
And so we'll continue to work with uh, them, but it's not just the policy you have to have and having uh, not only flown the F-16, but uh, understanding that maintenance is also a key part of that and, and training the maintainers. Um, and uh, we're working uh, digitally to make sure that the uh, Ukrainians have what they need, and uh, the goal is to get them the, those F-16s uh, uh, this summer. Okay. Next question, we'll go to ANSA, Matia. Yes, hi, uh, National Italian News Agency, ANSA. Um, it's just a follow-up question uh, to my colleague. Um, because we have been reading in the press about this uh, new extra Patriot system. There is no announcement today. Uh, but w what I would like to ask you is that we know that the U.S. is the biggest holder of these Patriot systems. So what, what is the, me the reason why you are holding the background? Is operational system uh, reasons that you, you can't uh, uh, move kit from one theater to the others? Uh, it's just for us to understand. And secondly, for you, General, uh, what is your assessment on, on the ongoing military campaign in, in Kharkiv? Do the Ukrainian forces have enough now to resist and possibly regain the initiatives? And, and do you see other critical risks along uh, the, the front right now? Thank you. Again, air defense remains a top priority, and we are working this on a daily basis. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I've seen some of the press reporting. Um, what I will tell you is that um, there will be no change in our Patriot coverage uh, in, in Poland. I know that that was a component of a previous story there, but there is no change in our Patriot coverage today. We're going to do everything we can to, uh, uh, to get uh, Ukraine uh, what it needs. We're going to encourage others. We're going to work with others to, uh, to get Ukraine what it needs uh, as quickly as we can. And this is not something that uh, Ukrainians are guessing at. I, I'm talking to them on a daily basis. So. Uh, re reference your question uh, regarding Kharkiv. Uh, what I would tell you, the situation is somewhat more stabilized now than it was uh, over the past uh, several weeks. And one of the things that the Ukrainians have been focused on uh, over the past several months uh, going into 24 is building out their defensive lines. And they've been uh, fairly effective in building those defensive lines, which has uh, created a bit of stability. You know, one of the challenges, though, is that when uh, with th that uh, the movement by the Russians towards Kharkiv, it actually pulls away focus and capability from other areas from, for the Ukrainians and spreads their, uh, their offenses a little bit more. Uh, but uh, what we've seen is that uh, Ukrainians have been very good at holding their defensive lines, and uh, I think they will be able to continue to do that uh, there in Kharkiv as well. Thank you. Next question will go to Voice of America. Carla. Chairman, um, I first to you, Mr. Secretary, I'd like a question to clarify U.S. policy. The Pentagon has said that Ukraine can strike inside Russian territory near the border with Kharkiv to, pre to prevent attacks on the Kharkiv area. But if Russia launches attacks on Ukrainian forces that aren't in Kharkiv from a military base deep inside Russia, can Ukraine strike that military target? And if not, why not? And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to you know, extend the question that my colleague asked and just more broadly, how would you describe the fight now between Russia and Ukraine? You mentioned that Ukraine continues to hold strong, but uh, is this still a stalemate? Thanks, Carla. Uh, as you know, uh, Ukraine requested permission to conduct counterfire in the Kharkiv area using U.S. weapons, and President uh, Biden uh, granted them permission to do that. Uh, and so um, at our policy in using uh, long-range strike to uh, capabilities to conduct strikes deep into Russia, that, that's not changed. Uh, so, but, but the ability to uh, conduct counterfire in this close fight in the Kharkiv Car Kharkiv region is, is what this is all about. And, uh, and the Ukrainians, my, my expectation is that they'll put that to good use. So. Hey, Car Carla, what, you know, I, I would share with you if, you, if you go back over the course of this, uh, uh, this conflict, uh, what the Ukrainians have been able to do to regain uh, greater than 50 percent of the territory that was first taken by the Russians, to be able to regain that, but at the same time, um, the support of this uh, contact group to help provide them capability uh, to defend themselves. I mentioned earlier about the defensive lines. They've been able to hold the defensive lines. But what we don't talk about is the amount of attrition that the uh, Ukrainians are able to put against the Russians, although they are outnumbered. Um, 
the, the way the Russians have uh, uh, lost uh, personnel, but also lost uh, uh, platforms, um, is, is pretty traumatic uh, from a uh, number standpoint. And the Ukrainians have done an effective job of holding those lines and continue to do so. Thank you. We have to, no, we have time for one more question. Let's go to Reuters. Sabine. Changed. Let's go to the final question here. Um, Secretary, um, several allies lifted some of the restrictions placed on the donated weapons about two weeks ago. Can you tell us what kind of an impact that has had on the battlefield so far? Have you seen progress? What kind of progress? Or isn't it going far enough for you? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for uh, what allies... Um, what weapons have been used or, or not used and what effects that's had. What I can speak to, though, is what I'm looking at in the Kharkiv region. The, the intent of uh, allowing them to conduct counterfire was to, was to help them uh, address the issue of Russians conducting staging, uh, or building staging areas uh, in, uh, on just on the other side of the border and attacking uh, uh, from those staging areas. Uh, so they have the ability to uh, to engage Russians just across the border now, and uh, and I'll leave it to the Ukrainians to talk about the specific effects that they've uh, uh, they've seen. But what I see is a slowing of uh, the Russians' advance and uh, and a stabilizing uh, of the uh, of that particular piece of the front. Now I think we'll see incremental gains and we'll see puts and takes. Uh, going forward, but again, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was concern that uh, we would see a, a significant breakthrough uh, on the part of the Russians. I, I don't think we'll see that going forward. I don't think the I, I don't see a, a large exploitation force that could could take advantage of a, a, a breakthrough. Uh, and I, I what I do see is, as the chairman has described, the, the Ukrainians have done a lot to fortify their defensive positions. And they're making good use of, uh, of the weapons that, uh, and, and munitions that they're being provided. And more of that will continue to flow in. And so, they, in my view, they'll get stronger uh, as, uh, as you know, time progresses. Uh, they're also doing things to, uh, uh, to mobilize more people and train more people. And so the combination of those things, I think, will, will, will have a a pretty substantial effect on the battlefield, but it, it will take some time to kind of play out. But the good news is that we have the means to continue to provide security assistance, and you'll see it continue to flow in in a very meaningful way. So. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our press briefing. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, gentlemen.